Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Learn with Lowell podcast. Uh, today, we're joined with Zane Witherspoon. He is a serial founder, data rights activist, applied cryptography, blockchain expert, a DJ, a world traveler, uh, currently living out in uh, New York. Um, he's basically a modern Renaissance man. And in this episode, you're just going to read a quick list of some things that we get into. We get into uh, you know, adapting to living in New York City uh, with Raspberry Pis and Arduinos, uh, making positive habits in the wake of COVID, um, making 3D mod modeling that kind of makes me hungry, uh, <laughs> to be honest, plant growing, uh, where he wants to travel to, winters, music that he loves. He, he, he produces music and, and makes music. Um, data rights and privacy, that's going to be a big meat of it. Um, strategies on staying connected, discussing data and its benefits. Basically, if you've always kind of wondered, like, what's the value of your data? You know, what, you know, Facebook's make collecting data on you, LinkedIn's, you know, Google, all these people are collecting data. And with all these new legislations, you know, stuff's happened from that. And uh, Zane's kind of at the forefront of making it so that you can make money off of it and take a lot of ownership back, which is fantastic. He's on the lookout for uh, new hires. He's, he's building his team. It's a team of five. Um, and he's growing pretty, pretty, pretty fast, pretty, pretty strongly. And um, basically, if anyone out there deals with a lot of data, wants to learn about, you know, their data uh, privacy, you know, rights and all these other things, or... Um, is a business or, you know, basically if you're excited about data and the trends to giving people more ownership of it, Zane's a really great person to reach out to. You're gonna get every link that we mentioned and like book, music, uh, person, everyone is linked in the show notes. And if you wanna check those out, go to the learningwithlowellpodcast.com. It's learningwithlowell.com, just to be clear. And we're found everywhere on where podcasts can be found, which is nice. So without further ado, let's get in, learn about Zane Witherspoon. Not uh, in any like stalkerish of ways because we're friends on Facebook, but I saw that you were building something with, I think, an Adreno. Um, and oh, the you... Raspberry Pi, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm curious if it's all right. What are you uh, What are you working on? What's the hobby that you're trying to play with? Yeah, I'm, I'm new to New York City and I'm still getting used to how bright it is here at night. Mm. And so I've got blackout curtains, which also makes it hard for me to wake up in the morning. So I bought a bunch of robotics parts so I can voice control my curtains and put them on a timer and make them smart curtains. So I got the little Raspberry Pi to be the brain of it and I'm gonna code it up. I've got some servo motors as well, and some pulleys to be able to move the curtains. <laughs> but I think it'll be a fun little, uh, fun little weekend project <laughs> to make my curtains all smart. That's awesome. The, I, I made a basically like a, like an old Nintendo thing. Like it plays all old games. I made it for my wife. And um, it's kind of like a gateway drug. I, especially like kind of knowing you, I feel like you'll, you'll do this. And then I'll talk to you like two weeks from now. And you're like, I've wired my entire house. I just walk up to it. The fob system unlocks it and lets me in. <laughs> you got like a yeah, little mansion layer. thinking about uh, our buzzer in New York, everybody has a buzzer to open the door and talk to the people downstairs. And so we want to make that smart too. Like we mm -hmm. have to get up every time somebody rings the doorbell. <laughs> So I can definitely see this becoming a, a series of projects pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And you could uh, potentially sync it to your phone. So you like, I don't, if it doesn't already do that. That'd be ideal. And, and so you could be, <laughs> you know, halfway across New York and someone could be pinging you and uh, you can be like, yes, I'm home, but I don't want to speak to you. Please don't break. Please do not break <laughs> in and steal my stuff. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> yes. Yes, I am here. Please leave package. Um, but outside of, uh, so that's pretty new for you. Are, do you have other, uh, you know, you know, hobbies or, or things that you do for fun that, yeah. you know, aren't engineering, you know, great technology. Absolutely. I mean, kind of what sparked this is uh, I've been a big gamer for my whole life. And it, during the quarantine, it became a little bit of a, I won't say a problem, but it became the default of how I spend my time. Anytime yeah. I had time to relax, I didn't really think about, oh, how should I spend this free time? I just kind of defaulted to games. And so I decided to take a month off of that. And there have been a couple like, what do I do with my hands kind of moments. Mm. But it's been really fun to do some music production. I've been remixing uh, Loser by Beck. And I've also been doing a little bit of 3D modeling. I've made all these uh, 3D donuts tutorials, which I've got to think. I saw that, yeah. anyway. <laughs> Couldn't have found a better tutorial out there. Um, so it's been really cool, actually, to explore a variety of different hobbies and sort of <laughs> realize uh, what you end up defaulting your time to isn't always what brings you the most joy mm -hmm. 
the I saw the, I saw the donuts and it reminded me of the Simpson donut that uh, Homer always runs down. It made me really <laughs> made me really hungry. Uh, I, I would uh, I could, especially because you yeah, kind of have to be cloistered up a lot with COVID going on. I would suggest you know get into growing plants. It's 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 really easy, and um, I can teach you some really cool stuff about like propagating them and uh, like making shoots or like grafting them together to make like a tree that makes apples and oranges at the same time. Dude, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, over here I've got uh, my pothos hanging from the window, a couple succulents, and a pineapple growing. Oh, there you go. You're already, you're already on it. There's there's something about taking care of something and seeing it grow that is, uh, you know, really beautiful and a lot of people don't. I don't know. Like, we're a part of nature. I have, my entire environment is kind of like set up for that. Do you, um, yeah, are, are you, oh, go ahead. Especially in a place like New York, where there's not a lot of nature around, it's good not to be like the only living thing in your apartment. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the what is is New York? After you've been there for a while, the place that you you want to be, or is there? Because you've been to a lot of places. I think you've been to Bay Area, you've been to Austin, you've been to places in Texas that won't mention, and then you've been to New York. <laughs> so, uh, um, I'm, I'm curious, like, what you know, sampling all these places. Is there a place that you know, feel Zane or is, is New York the best Zane place for you right now? I loved New York pre-COVID. Yeah. Uh, I think moving to any new city and I had a cousin who had a same, very similar experience trying to move to LA right before COVID broke out. Um, I moved to New York right before COVID broke out and just moving to any new city is already hard to like sort of build that foundational friend group. And when you add a pandemic on top of that, it's been a little bit tougher. I do wonder if I would be happier. A lot of people I know are moving to Miami right now. Mm -hmm. I've never been, but in the meantime, you know, at least get some sun while this whole thing settles down. But I would like to give New York a fairer non-pandemic shake at some point. I don't know mm -hmm. if it'll be here until that happens, but uh, <laughs> at some point I'm definitely going to spend some more time here. It's a magical city. Like when all the energy and people are buzzing around, uh, you've been, right? No, I've jumped off a train so I could avoid New York. But, there's, <laughs> but I, I almost, uh, I was put on a train that was going to take me that way. It was going to take an extra 24 hours and I jumped off that train. But there's, <laughs> there's so many people there. It kind of scares me. Like the Bay Area is not so bad. Chicago's not so bad. Boston's not so bad. Uh, for some reason, I think it's like 12 million people in New York. I don't know how to deal with that. I haven't, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't, I haven't scaled that mountain yet. It's a lot of people and that's what makes it exciting. It's like hanging out in a beehive. It's just there's mm -hmm. constant energy all around and it, it kind of like fuels you when everything is moving so fast you kind of feel like you need to pick up your pace a little bit and you can feel like you can have like four days in austin packed into one day in new york normally aspects outside of covid <laughs> yeah makes Which sense that i think it's fun yeah the yeah your environment's a big indicator of you know your success the, i think the japanese have a saying where a man is whatever room they're in so i imagine if you extrapolate that out to a city it's even bigger um yeah. I, I think COVID at current rates will probably be a thing until the end of the year. So you could potentially, you know, sublease your place and go to Miami for a while. And then you, you could live in the sun, especially during winter. That's kind of a nice thing. It's a feature. Yeah. Yeah. I, growing up in Texas, we used to make fun of all the snowbird Yankees, the people who lived in Northern cold places who would come down in the winter to escape the cold. Um, and then I got here and I was like, oh, I get it now. <laughs> <laughs> this sucks. I can see why we played it. Uh, that's, there, there's like a, there's like two weeks of winter that's like, wow, this is, this is really nice. And then <laughs> <laughs> there's followed by three more months. I, of, I hate they stopped playing Christmas carols. Like that wasn't mm -hmm. the only thing keeping people from, you know, going insane <laughs> for a while there. I, I imagine New York is a place that plays Frank Sinatra everywhere, but I know that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> not quite so true right now. Now, these days, it's a little more uh, Pop Smoke and ASAP Rocky. <laughs> mm. <laughs> a little Actually, more newer New York artist. <laughs> uh, spe speaking of music, I'm, I'm, uh, you, you talked about editing your own, and I, I believe you're a DJ as well. You do a lot of things. You're kind of a renaissance man. Um, are there good... Is there like a song or an album that you go to when you're trying to meditate or to start your day? Mm, I am very lyrically driven. Mm. Um, I was a singer for a very long time. And so lyrical music tends to not be the best for uh, meditation. 
in my experience because it does intentionally paint very vivid uh, mental imagery. But um, recently I've been uh, in love with the intersection of genres. And I think this was kind of like pushed to the forefront by Old Town Road actually, where they threw together rap and uh, country and they made it work so well. It's kind of like the, this genre bending sort of stuff that we're seeing come out. A lot of electronic cost crossed with different genres as well. Um, recently I've been, I've always been a fan. Electronic and hip hop have always been kind of like pushing into each other, but there've been a lot more electronic and uh, rock songs that have come out as well that I find really, really fun to listen to. Recently, my playlists have been a lot of uh, rap songs that are remixed as like housey electronic music because <laughs> I get the lyrics and I get like that steady kind of beat that's good mm -hmm. for running, working or whatever. That's <laughs> awesome. The, is there a... Uh... Is, I, is Old Time Road, I imagine, a band. So are there songs that you would uh, suggest as like a gateway drug? I have not listened to Old Time Road. Road. Is, uh, Old Time Road was, is, is the number one song of all time in terms okay. of number one song on the charts for the longest period of time. Um, it was by Lil Nas X. And he was this kind of like Twitter comedian rapper sleeping on his sister's couch. He seems like a really humble guy. I'm a big fan of his persona, but uh, he made this song that was like, he classified it as a country song, even though it was like pretty rap influenced. And it made all this controversy because it got put at the top of the country charts and a bunch of country people were like, no, 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 that's not country. You can't have that here. Mm -hmm. And actually it was Billy Ray Cyrus who heard it. Uh, Miley Cyrus's dad, uh, Achy Breaky Heart, who heard it and said, wait, who are we to say like what is and isn't country? He liked it so much. He hopped on and did a verse and collabed with him and rocketed it to the top of like all the pop charts. That's awesome. Where I think it held the spot for like 52 weeks or something like that. It's the number one, number one song. <laughs> um, still record unbroken. Okay, I'm definitely gonna listen to that after this. Uh, are, are you the <laughs> type to have like a, a private private spotify playlist or do you have it like linked somewhere for other people to check out yeah yeah my um <laughs> my dj name uh, very it's, it's like a triple entendre in the crypto world is dj eth ledger which a lot of djs use celebrity names kind of modified so it sounds like heath ledger but it's also like ethereum public ledger which mm -hmm. is a very technical description of like ethereum the biggest one of the second biggest uh, cryptocurrencies out there uh, so you should be able to find me either Zane Witherspoon or DJ Eth Ledger. Um, I highly recommend the DJ Eth Ledger playlist on my Zane Witherspoon Spotify account. Probably okay. want to go. <laughs> I'll, I'll link it in the show notes uh, and and listen to it after this. The, is there is there an artist that you'd love to? <laughs> I, I don't know, like you're like Beyonce or something. But is there like an artist that you'd love to like rip with? Um, this is weird. My musical idol, honestly, Billy Joe Armstrong, the composer and lead singer of Green Day. I have been, I was a big, they're my favorite band when I was little, and the ballads and rock operas that he put together, the way that you listen to some of these songs, like Jesus of Suburbia, it's a lot like uh, Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen, where it feels like six or seven songs stitched together, and it tells this whole long story with ups and downs and odds and ends, and I think that's so cool. Um, so I would, I would yeah, yeah, definitely Billy Armstrong, mm -hmm. <laughs> top of my list. That's sweet. The... There was a, a guy on my team last year that he would all, he'd have like dinosaur rock opera and it was the, like <laughs> it's like my life was not the same until I listened to it. Dinosaur rock. <laughs> it was awesome. It was like uh, I I don't even know. Uh, I'll have to look it up and like add it because I'm sure people are like uh, dinosaur rock opera. They're probably like but you don't want to hear about that. So I'll, I'll add it to the show notes. Um, <laughs> cool. So outside of music and outside of uh, moving to great places and 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 meeting people, um, what are you? you know, fathoming for the future right now. <laughs> there. <laughs> yeah. Um, right now, I've been, I, I mean, taking it back, kind of tying it into music, leaving high school, I had a choice. I could either pursue music and try to make any money out of it, or I had a little bit of talent in tech and I could actually um, have like a secure financial future. Growing up, like, it, it, impoverished, like I did with a single mother, I didn't really feel like I even had a choice. 
It's like I had to do the thing that was going to make money. And so a lot of what I've been doing in my career since then has been trying to enable people to make a living off of their creativity and make a living off of the content that they bring to society, even if it's not currently financially um, valued or not properly accommodated for. Um, and so uh, our last organization, our last company, Dispatch, took a blockchain high-tech solution to being a content delivery network, sort of like iTunes, but without the middleman. So mm -hmm. people who make music and make content can uh, actually share and make money off of their art. Uh, and since there have been some really interesting new regulations around data and a lot of interesting conversations like Andrew Yang's been proposing the data dividend and universal basic income, I think people have started to open their eyes to the potential economic inclusion of all participants in our digital ecosystem to be able to actually have some kind of monetization or some kind of compensation off of their data. So Dispatch was a very high tech project. The newest project, Fathom, you alluded to, um, is based a little bit more in the regulation that's come out to actually help people take back their data from these companies that are using it against us, like Facebook and Amazon, uh, Google, and sort of put it in the hands of the people. And we're still relatively early. We've had some good initial traction, um, but very much excited to explore this new world of our data and how it can empower us. Mm -hmm. And you, uh, there's a there's been a bunch of new laws in 2020 that have been about data privacy and giving people a little bit more sovereignty over their 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 rights. And you see, um, I was listening to the, an interview with the CEO of uh, Microsoft, where they um, they're just making the default privacy settings on everything. No matter, it's not like there's it's one set to like India or one set to the the EU. They just have made it like the most restringent possible because they, they assume that's where it's going to go, um, which is really great when you have someone you know something as big as Microsoft trying to you know, uh, be a part of that standard. Um, how, uh, how do you see 2021 shaping out for you? Like, what are your kind of like your, your, your objectives? Yeah. I mean, for us, our most important metric is how many people can we help reclaim their data? Mm -hmm. That is, that's the number one thing for us. Um, it would be great if we could also, you know, make a living off of doing that. And we think that the angle for that is channel partners. Instead of going direct to consumers with like, hey, take back your data, because we've tried that and they get it and they're like, all right, great, now what? Yeah. We've been going to businesses where your data could be useful for you, like job hunting sites. If you can um, share what your relationships are and who you're connected with, with a job hunting site, it could be a lot easier to figure out who in your network you didn't know was hiring might actually be able to refer you. So in that way, you could use your data to get a job. Um, there's other companies out there that are literally just trying to pay you for your data because there's so many market research companies that want to know either like what kind of content people are watching or what kind of uh, things people are buying off Amazon where they that data is so valuable to them, they will literally pay people for it. <laughs> and so it's sort of like the data dividend that we've been talking about, but kind of coming up with new creative ways to make it useful for you. Um, so that's for us personally. On the more macro scale, the new legislation that's come in, the new um, leadership in the US is a lot more friendly to data rights as a concept. And there's actually been a proposal, I believe it's called CORPA, Consumer Online rights to privacy act or something like that that uh has been proposed already i believe in the senate so we could see something that resembles the state of rights legislation like you see get in california or europe or massachusetts or hawaii and we could see it federally very soon which would of course be awesome for everybody mm -hmm. <laughs> except the big tech oligopolies which you know <laughs> i think we all kind of are starting to wake up to the sort of shadiness of their underlying businesses anyway. Mm -hmm. It's like the oil barons of the late 1800s. Like they, they've kind of had their fun. And so people are like, you know, <laughs> we, we probably shouldn't let you guys uh, own everything in, the, in these areas. Uh, you're getting a little too fat. I don't know if you watched the uh, the antitrust trials or whatever, the hearings with Mark Zuckerberg and the other people. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I watched uh, Mark Zuckerberg and was like, you're getting 
you're getting something coming your way. It's like they don't seem to like you very much, man. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think there's leaked document saying Zuckerberg um, saying they're at war with the U.S. government <laughs> mm. in their own uh, interpretation of it. So it's gonna be interesting to see how things shake out. You know, mm. there there are a couple of uh, apps that I've been using that I, it would probably be like a really good fit for what you're talking about. Uh, one in particular, um, it's called Lunch Lunch Club. I think I invited you to mm-hmm. it. And uh, it's really nice because it basically just automatically like links you with people and it lets you know like uh, what are the strengths of your network and stuff like that. Um, but yeah. the the strength of your network is more like a like a neat like oh it's nice, but there's it's not like uh, you know weaponized to be all that useful to me other than like I I can spe- uh, specify meeting more business development people. But I I I think I, I imagine that if you were to like work with them, you could actually make it so that there was a lot more targetable insights and, and making it more a- actionable for people like me who, you know, um, I, I've been using it for the last like five weeks. It's awesome. Nice. Yeah. Uh, have you found that you've gotten some useful connections, people you're going to follow up with over lunch club? Oh yeah. I follow up with everybody. I, I meet someone. It's like, you're really good at that though. <laughs> <laughs> not a jerk. All right. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll uh, you know, stay in touch and forward on people and, I think it's great. I, I generally think that everyone should have a so many people. You're so good. How do you stay in touch with so many people? I feel like I, if I actually tried to keep up with every single person I met, I would just be sending texts and emails all day long. I wouldn't have time for anything else. How do you keep up with? Oh, uh, there's a, there's a good rule of thumb. So basically, uh, I forget the exact one. I just kind of, there are people that you should kind of message all the time. If you have that type of relationship, there are people that are more mentors or you're trying to get to be mentors. And then you, you do it like maybe once a quarter until they start, you know, showing that they're much more open to talking sooner. But there's usually like a cadence for it. Um, so like, you know, once a month I'll, I'll ping people about something if I think it's applicable. Um, and then I try and just, if I see something out there, I have a really good memory for people as well. So I, I could write this all down. I tend not to write things down because I just remember every, um, pretty much every detail of a person I meet. Uh, give or take, if I see them again, like, oh, okay, you know, Zane told me about this thing, you know, uh, about a place in, 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 in uh, Texas. And so, uh, and I'll remember it, but it's, I, I think it's not doing it all the time. It's like setting a time to do it. And so like, I'll see something, I'll think, oh, this is really cool. I think Zane might like this. And there's actually a couple of things I'm going to send you um, later this week, because I've been thinking like, oh, you might like these things. And so I'll basically just, uh, I'll bookmark them. And then when I go to like follow up at like a uh, like there's like a, a block of time that I'll like follow up with people, um, which is usually like once a month or every couple of weeks, depending on what I'm doing. Um, then I just be like, okay, I know where those things are. And then I do it. It's similar to how I do research. Like I'll, I'll research a bunch of stuff and then I'll basically outline how I think, like what my thoughts are. And then I'll go back through and then pull the citations that I already have in my mind. And so I'm sure you could like automatize it. So it's much easier, like use an air table, like, oh, this is Zane. He likes uh, music, um, using kind of like CRM or anything like that to remember these people, but it sounds like you just got a steel trap. Yeah. Uh, I, it's, I have, I've tried using an air table or I, I kind of like an Excel spreadsheet, but all I need, um, like the most I'll get is like a name and then like where I know that person from. And then that's usually the only pieces of data I, I need. Um, I've tried doing that. I, I generally don't need it, but I think it's nice. Um, but it's really just an effort thing. Like I also trust my instincts a lot. If I, you know, uh, I'm getting much better at this, but, uh, in, in general, like if, uh, if someone seems like a good person trying to do something, I'll remember them and then like, you know, put stuff out there for them. But I, for people who want to do better on that, uh, just kind of like block a time for it. Like literally put it in your calendar, you know, two times a month, you know, reach out to people. And it can be something really small. Like, Hey, I, I, hey, Zan, I, I saw this, you know, article that you, you'd like here, are some, my thoughts that I thought you'd like on it. And it's kind of nice because then it's like, I imagine you, it's kind of like getting a letter in a mail. That's not a bill. Like, it's, it's like, <laughs> and then, uh, and then it's like, oh, you just, you know, you got a, a thing that I saw and I was thinking of you. And so it kind of like, like furthers that conversation, even if we aren't able to sit down like all the time to have a conversation, which would, you know, would be great. Cause I think we, we gel really easily. Um, mm-hmm. It kind of keeps the memory alive. Cause I know, I didn't know for a long time I had a good memory. For, for people and then uh people were like how do you remember these details and i was like what, what do you mean you just you know you, you just focus on it <laughs> you don't you don't just remember like uh you know the color of the tie of like of the you know when you first met someone um but i don't have a photographic memory i just uh but people are something i really pay attention to it's um yeah, it's for a variety good. of reasons yeah <laughs> 
Um, are there, is there, um, is there anything like that that you're working on that um, like staying in touch outreach or anything like that, that you're trying to improve? Um, we are working with some CRMs um, because right now your contacts are generally locked up behind Facebook and Twitter's walled gardens. Mm -hmm. Really the only place if you sign up for a CRM kind of service you can get your data from is Google has an API to access your Google contacts and you can usually share your address book, book off your phone. But if you haven't emailed or called that person before, nobody knows if you've ever spoken. You know? mm -hmm. So um, thanks to these laws, you can actually download all of your connections from Facebook, from Twitter, from LinkedIn, uh, from all these other companies and actually sort of incorporate all of those. It's the right to data portability is what it mm -hmm. is. It's phrased in legal speak. So you can download it and then use it in these tools. Now the companies, they really don't want you to do this because they know their data is valuable. And so they put a bunch of hoops that you have to jump through. You gotta log in, you gotta find the page, you gotta request the data download, usually a two-factor auth. You gotta wait for them to email you back, it could be days later. And then you gotta go in and download it. And if you wanna use it on a tool, you gotta re-upload it. And it is challenging even for somebody really tech literate. So we make it really, really easy. <laughs> We're really good at that side of the tech. Um, mm -hmm. Again, we could build out tools to help you like see your network, but there's so many tools already where people go where they have a pain point, a problem, like these personal CRMs, where their problem is they want to remember who they spoke with and who's in their network, um, where we could just sort of plug in and be that sort of data pipeline. It's a little bit more um, the angle that we've gone for. I We recently learned a term from some of the mentors in this accelerator program we're part of, of iPaaS, the integration platform as a service, which is tools like Segment and MuleSoft and Dalbumi and Zapier, where they can connect a ton of different APIs and give you sort of like one integration to rule them all. And now there's a whole bunch of new data out there, thanks to these laws that nobody's really had access to before, uh, that we're kind of exploring a lot of these different avenues of where this data could be useful. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's all about just talking to as many people working with data as we can. If they've got any idea of thinking at all about data privacy, we would love to speak with them, learn more about what their thoughts are and if there's any pain points that we could help solve. Great. Uh, I, I was thinking about it. Um, so like for everyone who doesn't have a good memory, it'd probably be pretty cool if you could like pull it all into one place and then like pull their like LinkedIn photo as well. So you have like that visual cue. There's people who go to conferences that literally take selfies of themselves, like, oh, it's me and Zane. And then they literally will, you know, and then they remember it. Selfies. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So it's like a, a digital selfie stick or a digital selfie <laughs> uh, of your network. So you can be like, oh, that, oh, that's Zane. And uh, that's, you know, you know, Cameron or whomever. And uh, yeah. makes it, I, I could see like all that piping into one thing, into one folder. That'd be really great. Cause sometimes I, I worry about like forgetting people sometimes. Yeah, no, it's real. It's crazy how much more data these companies know and have. They know so much more about our relationships than we do. Mm -hmm. It's wild. You know, if you were to list like the top 10 people that you talk to most often, I was surprised how off I was. <laughs> uh, I mean, the first like one, two, three, you can usually nail, but then it's a little bit scattershot. You'd be surprised. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're just, they have all the data and they've been using our data to make decisions for years. We know it's valuable and it's time for us to be able to make decisions off our data too. For anyone who hasn't seen it already, The Social Dilemma is a mm -hmm. documentary on Netflix that I highly recommend. It breaks down sort of some of the data they have now it's currently being used against us in a really digestible uh, layman's kind of way. Mm -hmm. Wasn't there a, uh, another documentary called The Great Hack or something that was also really yeah. good? That one was specifically focused around Cambridge Analytica and the scandal that went on there. Um, it's a bit more technical um, and it focuses a lot around someone I know pretty well, Brittany Kaiser, who was the Cambridge Analytica whistleblower, who's since turned around to become a lobbyist for data rights and uh, founder of the Own Your Data Foundation, which is all about digital literacy and helping people understand the value of their data. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's, there's, it's a very timely issue. People are very much waking up to what's going on. Mm -hmm. but the, could, 
could you um could you pull all the information and then know what the best place to contact someone is so like like there's linkedin there's email there's text but people you know everyone kind of has their like sweet spot for where they want to talk and that's actually goes to my question like where would you like people to contact you um if they know people in the data privacy area you don't want to you know further on mm -hmm. with you but uh could is that something else that you could do like find like pull them in and then know like uh zane really likes it if you send an email or uh absolutely yes uh, there's a uh, analytics on data is so cool uh, i think as a nerd <laughs> but you can tell not only what platform people are most likely to respond on but what day of the week, what time of day, um, what sentiment of message they'd be most likely to respond to. There's all sorts of stuff that you can pull out of this data. Um, and now we finally have access to it. And it's about trying to figure out how to include as many people as possible in the value of this data and what use cases are most useful. You know, the relationship data, I think is really interesting. Um, but some of the other stuff that you could use is your shopping data, figure out your shopping history and your shopping trends so you can help budget for yourself personally or um your health data is one that gets talked about a whole lot as well being able to combine the data from your fitbit the data from your iphone the data from your aura ring <laughs> and potentially even the data from uh, your primary care physician too mm -hmm. yeah that stuff siloed like crazy a, a clean a clean digital record is, is like worth like 10 grand or something like that to these uh, r d firms uh so that's, that's pretty big there are uh, there are a bunch of other like relationship style applications or uh, yeah, like one's called Kona, they just launched recently, which is about um, at, like basically promoting EQ in the workplace using Slack. So they like ping people and kind of give you insights into your coworkers using semantic analysis as well. Um, I would imagine there's, there could be some cross pollination there. Uh, they're pretty early, they just finished a $1 million raise um, and they're out in LA. But uh, as, as someone, uh, as something like maybe the, the cross um if anyone else has ideas on, on you know areas or people that suggest I, I think a big problem not a problem but like an opportunity for most people is there's usually that like oh that's stupid i shouldn't suggest that um i i've spent a lot of time listening to people and you i it's very surprising how often someone will say well this might be a dumb idea and then says something that's a genius so if you have an idea don't think oh you know zane probably knows that person or he probably already has that idea because at the very least you know, imagine someone heard you asking for help and they were like, hey, here you go. Wouldn't that feel great? So like, let's all like help Zane feel great. And then he'll talk to you and it'll be a great conversation. Um, it, it's, it's really easy to talk to. So uh, for everyone listening, like kind of take that barrier down. And, and I don't know, like Zane's like a, a, a new person, but um, definitely just just do it. And uh, he's never been mean to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let's, you know, sample size of one at least. Um, yeah, love so, to hear from anyone out there who's got, good ideas about how to use this data. Mm -hmm. Especially if you uh, have a relationship with lots of consumers in a way that could help them, whether that's through a tech platform or an Instagram page or anything like that, I um, would love to chat. So the best way to reach me is probably zane at fathomprivacy.com. Mm -hmm. And I'll have that in the show notes as well. Um, you also have a, I think you have a LinkedIn page. I think most people have a LinkedIn page. Yeah. Um, with a spoon, I'm pretty much the only one out there. <laughs> yeah, you know, the first time I met you, I was like, I wonder if this guy's related to the other Witherspoon, but I probably shouldn't ask. <laughs> There's a few Witherspoons out there. Yeah. Um, definitely, it's super distantly related to Reese because we have a common ancestor, John Witherspoon, who signed the Declaration of Independence. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, right? So a little uh, family history there. Yeah, my family were farmers, and I think Vikings but really nice Vikings. We were just traders. We were like, we'll come to town. Do you want to buy our wares? And they would like say with like an ax on the table. So they knew like you should buy something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they just went about their day. Um, but uh, so for, for the, for the fathom team. So I think I had um, the names forget me. So see, I don't have a perfect memory, but the, um, the one, the, the startup that you had before this, the one that got to a team of 20 dispatch labs, dispatch. Thank you. Um, how big is the engine at your at your current on your current team? Right now, we are about five people. We've got three full time. Myself, I'm lucky enough to be working with my brother Jason, who's uh, about twenty seven years older than me, and uh, really, really brilliant with data. Uh, you did data management for Apple and supply chain at uh, Disney and Lucasfilms, 
And uh, one of my former team members at Dispatch too, Shadon Azali, is also part of the founding team. And then we've got an, an advisor for tech and an advisor for design. We both do incredible work as well. Do you, is there, um, is there anyone missing? Is there any uh, expertise or it, it could be as a, an advisor or as a member of the team that you're looking for? Our strength is definitely tech. I think we are kind of settling into the sales and marketing kind of responsibilities. We're pretty good at identifying good customers and explaining to them what value we could bring on the sales side, but it's a lot of outbound right now. Uh, at some point, we would like to shift our strategy to be more inbound, to get in front of more people and have them think, oh, I should reach out to them. Mm -hmm. It's sort of the direction that we would like to go. And we've got, we've been talking with some, uh, some very friendly people who aren't official advisors yet, but have been giving us some really good advice about how to tackle uh, surprisingly enough, Facebook ads tends to be the most effective even for B2B. Hmm. Um, it's interesting. It should be yeah. pretty cheap right now too. Most people, I don't, I don't think a lot of people use Facebook for B2B, but what are, is there like an, I, do you know your ideal customer demographic or is it more of like a psychographic thing? It's, we had a very strong, we had a, very strong idea of who our ideal customer would be. And we've since realized that it's a lot wider than that. Mm. The place where we're solving the best niche first, like the most immediate pressing need, is sort of this new wave of startups that is using your data as part of their value props specifically. There's a lot of data wallets out there, um, some of which are coming from the quote unquote web 3.0 decentralized blockchain kind of space. And for them, their value prop is helping you monetize your data or get hired off your data or something like that with your data. And we have the data pipelines already. They'll all need to build out the actual tools to get the data from these sources. And so instead of every company building that out in-house again and again and again, uh, we've got it already built, done really, really well. Hmm. That said, even companies that aren't focused on being a quote unquote data wallet would have great uh, value props with us, like the relationship data that we've alluded to being great for job hunting and hiring um, and investment platforms too are another really interesting use case that we've seen for like a history of your shopping data to be able to benefit you, give you an unfair advantage while trading. Mm -hmm. Well, the, um, it, but based on that, I think it, it might be interesting if you like targeted places like Y Combinator and then just like grabbed their entire batches and talk to them. All of them are really great. Like I, I'll routinely just like talk to everyone at a white combinator batch and just ask them what they're up to. Um, and then, you know, they're always, you know, pretty friendly. Um, but I imagine yeah. just on like the density of like, you know, capital factory out in Austin, um, the accelerator you're in right now, like all those places are pretty great. Cause they kind of like are atom smashers or like uh, carbon smashers, which makes diamonds. So, um, and then you can kind of be really dense and being known in those areas. There's a there's a um, an interesting idea uh, called like a thousand true friends, and so um, would you want to be known by a hundred thousand random people or one thousand of the right people that would really get in love what you're doing? It's usually one thousand right people, which is harder to do. Like you can you can throw Facebook ads and get like ten thousand people to know who you are, um, or have a well, you know like a little bit of like a brand image, um, but then how many will matriculate and how many of those will actually become like you know zealots for what you're doing? Um, so it might be fun if you just called up a bunch of like, you know, uh, you know, YC or other startups and be like, Hey, I'm working on this thing. Yeah. I've got a few friends who are currently going through Y Combinator that uh, we've spoken with already. I'll do a little bit of research into who else is in their batch and see if it might be right to ask for some introductions there. Yeah. I mean, you're basically saving their, you know, you're, you're, you're literally coming in pre-built with a, with the giant value add to their users, which makes them able to do their thing better and easier. And sure. they're already dealing with the accelerator. So that's like one less thing that they have to worry about. And uh, your subject matter expert as well, which is pretty nice for them. It's kind of like having an advisor, like Tanner generally um, on the on the team. Um, in terms of hiring, I'm, I'm curious. So um, the are there, um, for people you're bringing on the team, are there key things that you look for? Like are there key aspects that you, you know, your ideal culture that you try to like have people add into or, um, 
Yeah, yeah, I think culture is the most important thing at this size. Um, there's generally a lot of people with a lot of high quality skill sets to target, to hire pretty much all the time. But when you're small, uh, I, I think I read somewhere that your company culture is determined by your first 10 hires pretty much. Yeah. Like that's going to set the precedent. Uh, we look for people who go above and beyond and show initiative, especially outside of the things that they're specifically asked to do, which is really important at this phase. You got to be able to not just have everything delegated to you, but be able to come up with ideas that you know are valuable and execute on them. Um, that said, we're not, we also don't want somebody who's too, we're a pretty laid back group. So uh, we don't want people who are driving too hard to work nights or weekends. Um, we believe strongly in the philosophy that it doesn't have to be crazy at work. Um, your mental health, you can't put a price on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so uh, on both sides of that, we want somebody who's got a lot of initiative and clearly shows talent at what they do, but also knows like when's the appropriate time to push, when's the time to stop and reevaluate. Mm -hmm. Do, are there, um, how do you, uh, what are, have you found effective ways to, to assess for that? It generally tends to be homework. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of the try before you buy, a small, yeah. tiny, tiny agreement, like a week maybe, and see what work they deliver. And if they go above and beyond, that's, in my experience, far and away, the best way to uh, assess. Because it, so many people... I've met brilliant, brilliant people who it just does not shine through in meetings and conversations, yeah. you know, and it's tragic to pass up on such great talent just because they don't interview very well yeah. and vice versa. You know, there's people who like come in super personable in the interview <laughs> and seem like they'd kill it. And then when they're actually supposed to do work, they just kind of like sit there with, you know, <laughs> yep. drooling or whatever. <laughs> uh, do you, do you build any type of single source of truth? uh into your guys's workflow that is such an interesting question that that is a pain point that we have talked with so many customers about a uh, single source of truth with so many different data sources is hard <laughs> it is uh still an unsolved problem for sure my brother would be the person to answer this most effectively he's our chief data officer and he has been giving a lot of thought for many years about a, he describes it as like a topographical ontology where experts can sort of weigh in on how different terms are related to one another and which sources of truth might be more valid than one another. Um, he's a huge asset to the team on that front. <laughs> but that's, that, that, that is, he could go really deep into the weeds on that kind of problem. I think it's interesting too. Uh, good to have them on the team. All right, so, so so a lot of times when people are listening to someone for the first time, um, they got, get this impression where it's like, like nowadays, like people think Tesla and SpaceX, they were always meant to be that way and they never had problems and it was just glorious. And it's like, all this rockets blew up. <laughs> you almost had a panic attack. Like, no, that's not how it is. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, what is, um, what is a problem or a question that you have right now that you don't have the answer to that someone listening could help out with? Hmm. There's a, uh, the big question right now in the world of data rights is enforcement. We have all these laws coming out, all this legislation, and companies really don't want to give up this data, even though now they legally have to. And there's still open questions around the legality of taking this data in an automated fashion. Uh, LinkedIn, for example, prohibits any use of automation on their platform. It's against their terms of service. But if that terms of service interferes with people's ability to enforce public policy, that's still an open question. This is a brand new legislative space. Mm -hmm. And we are very much betting on the legislation continuing to fall in favor of the consumer. Um, that is a gamble. <laughs> the courts of law can be unpredictable and uh, we therefore really need to be a lot closer with the 
trailblazers in this space. The people who are not just on the legislative side, but on the lobbying side and in the courtrooms actually helping determine this law too. So it remains to be seen if uh, Twitter, for example, is going the opposite direction where they actually want to make their whole platform decentralized and they want to make, be able to not be able to censor people. There's almost like an infinite amount of uncertainty. The number of players that are playing in the space from legislators to consumers, to big companies that could quickly change directions and throw us way off course very quickly. Mm -hmm. But um, for those of us who are true believers in data rights and believe that this is what the people want and they just need a little bit more education, uh, not necessarily worried about it. But yeah, there's so many open questions. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm thinking of some people myself, so I'll, I'll ping you after this. But um, so are there are there good books or resources they'd recommend for people who want to, you know, read up? It could be about startups. It could be about data privacy. It could be about blockchain, you know, in, in your go-tos. The best book I've ever read is this one right here. It's called The Messy Middle hmm. by Scott Belsky. Um, he was an entrepreneur who started Behance, which was kind of like a portfolio website for creatives. Oh, I love that. And uh, sold it to, uh, to uh, Adobe at a certain point. And this book felt like it was giving me a hug. <laughs> like I've never had a book explain the entrepreneurial process and struggle so well and give such candid, direct advice. And it's broken down into tiny little chapters, like two, three pages long that make me feel like I'm really fast at reading too, you know? <laughs> so it's, it's a very good personable book and incredibly educational. It's my favorite business book by far. I can't recommend it highly enough. The Messy Middle, Scott Belsky. Is there a, is there a quote from that or um, a quote in general that you, you think about a lot? <laughs> uh, quote, my favorite quote is actually very different at the spectrum. Uh, the creator, Donald Glover, hmm. also known as Childish Gambino, uh, who I admire so much as a person, like a quadruple threat. If it makes you nervous, you're doing it right. Hmm. So you got to get out of your comfort zone. You know, if you're in a place where you're unsure, that is where you grow. That is where you find new ground. That's definitely my advice. Move to New York. It'll make you uncomfortable. If it, if it makes you uncomfortable to think about visiting, you should definitely visit. <laughs> uh... <laughs> yeah, okay <laughs> i'll think about it and that was zane witherspoon like i said we got into so much uh new york city building projects data privacy uh andrew yang elon musk uh the great hack the social dilemma Brittany kaiser the future of regulation and in his eyes you know where he really needs help and uh outreach from so like I said in the beginning, if you are into data privacy, if you're a company or a startup founder or a person who works at a company that has to do with a lot of data, uh, relational data, um, everything that he just said, definitely reach out to him. Email is going to be in the show notes. He also uh, typed it out. Everything that we talked about is going to be in the show notes. And every episode from here on out is going to have that type of, of easy access. Um, to kind of click through and enjoy what's going on. This one has a lot of great music and his playlist. Uh, so without further ado, you know, just thanks for coming out. Thanks for listening in. Let me know what you think. This is gonna be on YouTube and every podcast platform that you can imagine. And if it's not, you come let me know and I will get my podcast on there.